الحمد لله واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار الحمد لله we praise Allah and we seek his assistance and we seek his forgiveness and we seek refuge in Allah from the evil within ourselves and from our bad deeds whoever Allah guides there is none that can lead him astray and whoever is there is saved and there is no guide for him I bear witness to la ilaha illallah he is alone and has no partners and I bear witness that Muhammad is his slave and his messenger O you who believe fear Allah as you ought to be feared and don't die except as Muslims O humanity fear your Lord who has created you from a single soul and created from it its mates and scattered from them too many men and women and fear Allah for whom you demand your mutual right and don't cut off relations with the wounds that bore you indeed Allah is a raqib over you O you who believe fear Allah and say that which is correct in order that he may accept from you your deeds and forgive you of your sins and whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has achieved the greatest achievement amma ba'du certainly the most truthful speech is the book of Allah and the finest guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the most evil of affairs are newly invented matters in this deen and every newly invented matter in this deen is a bid'ah and every bid'ah is a string and every string is in the hell for it <coughs> uh, this topic we have not come to take your leadership this topic is nasiha to the leaders of the muslims and to the masses of the muslims in accordance with the statement of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam الدين النصيحة الدين النصيحة الدين النصيحة قلنا ولمن لا يص... لا ولمن لا يرس... لا ولمن يا رسول الله قال الله ولكتابه ولرسوله ولأئمة المسلمين وعامتهم and this hadith has been authentically collected by Imam Muslim <coughs> where the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said this deen is Uh, sincere advice, this deen is sincere advice, this deen is sincere advice. They said to who ya Rasul Allah? He said to Allah, to his book, to the, his messenger, to the leaders of the Muslims and the common folk among the Muslims or the rest of the Muslims. So this talk insha'Allah ta'ala, it is advice to the leaders among the Muslims and then the masses of the Muslims and how to deal with their leadership. <coughs> The ulama of Islam, rahimahum allahu jami'an, they have established for us in their books of aqeedah, and their books on the belief uh, uh, system of the Muslim, or the Muslim creed, the ulama have established for us our position concerning leadership in Islam, and the leaders in Islam. And we're going to start off, insha'Allah ta'ala, with some statements of the ulama from their books and aqeedah on the position of the Muslims on this issue of leadership and the leaders. And we start off with the statement <coughs> of Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah, as he was explaining to one of his students whose name is Shu'ib, The belief, of, the belief of the Muslims until he came down to this part and he said, Ya Shu'ib, what you have written down for me would not benefit you until you make Salat behind every leader, whether he is righteous or corrupt. And that jihad 
is ongoing and everlasting with him until the day of Yom al -Qiyama. And that patience is with the leader, whether he is oppressive or righteous. Here is Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah, and we're going to see from the rest of the statements of the ulama that he's beginning to show us, or we're seeing from his statement, our position concerning the Muslim leaders. And of course we're going to bring the ayat from the Book of Allah and the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to substantiate the position that the ulama of Islam have taken. But this point here that we see whether the leader is righteous or corrupt, evil or good or whatever, that it is upon the Muslims to follow that leader. As Sahlul ibn Abdullah at Tustari, he said in his Aqidah, which is very short, and do not leave the Jama'ah Salat behind every leader, whether he is oppressive or righteous. And that this issue of the Salat, and we're going to see, as they mentioned this leadership around the Salat, that making Salat behind our leaders is compulsory on the believers. Whether the leader is righteous or wicked, it doesn't make a difference. It is compulsory for the believers to follow their leaders. Abdullah, uh, excuse me, Ali al-Madini, rahimahullah, and uh, these two people, Sufyan al-Thawri, and Sahlun ibn Abdullah, I have forgot the actual uh, time that they have died, but it's around 200 Hijra. And then we have Ali ibn al-Madini who died 236 Hijra, and this statement was in his Aqidah that hearing and obeying is for the leaders of the Muslims and the Imams, the righteous among them and the wicked. And whoever becomes the Khalifa by the consensus of the Muslims and they are pleased with him. Here Ali ibn al-Madini rahimahullah he's showing that we have to hear and obey the Imams and the leaders of the Muslims. And the Imams and the leaders of the Muslims, they're known to the Muslims wherever you are and that they have to be obeyed and listened to as Ali ibn al-Madini rahimahullah had stated. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal rahimahullah who died 241 Hijra he said in his Aqidah, which has been translated to English, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy to uh, publish it so it can be available for the Muslims. He says, hearing and obeying is for the Imams and the leaders of the Muslims, the righteous among them and the wicked. And whoever becomes the Khalifa and the people have agreed that he is the leader and they are pleased with him, whether he got there by overthrowing the previous government or he became the leader any way that he came there and the people agreed that he was the Amir al-Mu'minin or the leaders of the Muslims, then it is upon us to listen to him and to obey him. Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah who died 256 Hijra, he has in his Aqidah and so far I've been quoting from a book, Sharh Usul Al-I'tiqal li Ahl Al-Sunnah Wal Jama'ah, written by Imam Al-Lalakahi, who died 418 Hijra. In the beginning of his book on the belief of the Muslims, he has stated the belief of some of the famous scholars of Islam, and I'm quoting from their belief, or their aqa'id. Imam Al-Bukhari says that we would not uh, compete or try to take the leadership of those who are in leadership position from the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then we'll bring that later on insha'Allah ta'ala Ismail ibn Yahya al-Muzani who died 264 he said in his Aqeebah Sharh Sunnah that obedience is for all of the leaders and the issues that are pleasing to Allah Taala, and that we should stay away from those things that are displeasing to Allah and that to leave uh, opposition of the leaders whether they are righteous or they are corrupt and to repent to Allah Taala, and to be kind to our leaders here Imam 
Ismail ibn Yahya al-Muzani Rahimahullah He's mentioning in his point the leaders He's using another terminology That would show that this issue of leadership is broad And not to just the people who are termed as that is an, a leader Or that is an imam As we know that we have in some of the Islamic centers Or some of the Islamic organizations Maybe the person is called the president Or the chairman of the board Or whatever you call that person or those people that are in leadership position among the Muslims all of them they have to be obeyed as Ismail ibn Yahya al-Muzni says and this is a part of the belief of the Muslims Abu Hashim uh, and Abu Zur'a rahimahumullah who died uh, after 266 Hijra they said in the Aqidah that was uh, narrated by the son Ibn Abi Hashim he said that his father and Abu Zur'a, they said that we don't see it permissible to oppose or overthrow the Imam. Nor is it permissible to fight in the times of fitna. And we see it compulsory to hear and to obey whoever Allah Azza wa Jal has made in charge of us. And that it is impermissible to compete with them, to overthrow them or to uh, think that we have the choice to obey them or not to obey them to the end of the statement that he made oh excuse me then he adds and we follow the sunnah and the jama'ah and we stay away from shudud wal khilaf wal firqa and we stay away from irregular irregularities or differences of opinion. Imam al Sahawi, rahimahullah, who died 321, he tells us in his Aqidah, Al Aqidah al Sahawiya, and it has been translated into English and it's available for the believers, alhamdulillah. He says, We don't see it permissible to overthrow the Imam or the people who are in charge of the affairs of the Muslims, even if they are oppressors. We don't call the people to be opposed them or against them and we don't uh, oppose them or we don't compete with them and not obeying them or what is meant by the statement. And we see that it is compulsory to obey them in those affairs that they have obeyed Allah in and that this is compulsory and that we do not follow them if they command us to do that which is sinful and we make dua to Allah for, their, for them to be among the righteous and for them to have a general, a good general well-being. Abu al-Hassan al-Ashari, rahimahullah, who died 324 Hijra, he says, and we see or we view that you should make dua for the imams of the Muslims that they would be among the righteous and that we establish their leadership and that whoever opposes them are astray even if they oppose the leaders when the leaders are not uh, upright and we view from this deen that it is not permissible to overthrow them by means of the sword and we view that we leave alone fighting in the days of fitness all of these imams and i just wanted to read a list of them so that we can see that generation after generation that the Imams of the Muslims, the ulama and the scholars of the Muslims, they all are saying the same thing in relationship to our belief in leadership as Imam al-Barbahari rahimahullah who died 329 Hijra and his book Sharh al-Sunnah has been translated into English and it's called the Creed and he says hearing and obeying is for the Imams and that which Allah loves and that which Allah is pleased with and whoever becomes the Khalifa from the consensus of the people and that they are pleased with him then he is the Amir al-Mu'mineen or the leader of the Muslims and it is not permissible for anyone to go to sleep one night without giving him the bay'ah and we see that it is it is not permissible for anyone to go to sleep one night 
without giving bay'ah to this imam, to this khalifa, the emir al-mu'mineen, whether he is righteous or corrupt. This statement of Imam al-Barbahari, and we just want to take a look at it, he's showing us that hearing and obeying is for all of the leaders of the Muslims. But for the khalifa, or the one sole ruler and leader of all of the Muslims in the world, that there is something particular to him that's not particular to any imam other than him, and that is giving him the bay'ah, and whoever does not give him the bay'ah, then he is not from among the Muslims if he dies in that state. Whether that khalifa or that leader is corrupt or righteous. And here we're just trying to make the point that there's a difference between the khalifa or the one sole leader of the Muslim and then the rest of the leaders of the Muslims. Ibn Abi Zayd al-Qirawani rahimahullah died 386 and uh, his aqeed alhamdulillah has been translated into English and some of it has been explained. He says, an obedience is for the imams of the Muslims and whoever is the leader or in charge of the affairs of the Muslims and for the scholars among the Muslims. So here Ibn Abi Zayd al-Qirawani rahimahullah he's also adding that the ulama or the people of knowledge are also among the people who must be obeyed. That this hearing and obeying for the leaders of the Muslims are those, or those who are in charge of the affairs of the Muslims and also the ulama of the Muslims. And that this is a part of the belief of the Muslims. Ibn Baqa rahimahullah who died 387 Hijrah, he also says, and it is not permissible to oppose or to overthrow by means of the sword the Imam, even if the Imams are oppressive themselves. Muhammad ibn Abdullah al zamanin who died 399 Hijrah, he said, hearing and obeying is for the leaders of the Muslims. And that this is compulsory, no matter how much the leaders fall short, that the people must, mustn't fall short in their obedience to him. Abu Mansur, Ma'mar ibn Ahmad al-Asfahani, rahimahullah, died 418. He also says, hearing, <coughs> he says, from the Sunnah is obedience to the leaders and the Khalifa. And that it is not permissible to oppose them or to try to overthrow them by means of the sword, even if they are oppressors. And that you listen to them and you obey them, even if it is an Abyssinian slave, Ajda, mutilated. So here, Abu Mansur, Ma'mar ibn Ahmad al-Asbahani, rahimahullah, he's also making the difference between the regular leaders of the Muslims and the one sole leader or the Khalifa of the Muslims. Al-Sabuni, rahimahullah, he also shows in his Aqeedah that the people of Hadith That the people of Hadith, they see that it is compulsory to make the Jumu'ah and the Su'i Salat and the rest of the Salat behind every Muslim Imam, whether he's righteous or corrupt. And they see that it is compulsory to fight uh, with them when they are fighting Jihad and that even if they are corrupt or righteous, we still fight with them. And we see that it is compulsory on the Muslims to make dua, that the leaders are righteous and that they are successful. Ismail al asfahani and we'll make this inshallah the last one before the Adhan. Qudai 535 Hijrah, he says that hearing and obeying is for the leaders so long as they make salah and that we make jihad with them, and that we do not oppose them, and that we obey them, but we don't obey anyone in disobedience to Allah. And we'll take a pause for the adhan, inshaAllah. Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah, who died 1206 Hijrah, he says in his book, Kitab al-Tawheed, which has been translated into English, chapter, whoever obeys the scholars and the leaders and that which is haram and that uh, 
and that which they prohibit from the things that Allah has made permissible or that which they make permissible from the things that Allah has made haram then they have taken their leaders and their scholars as Lord besides Allah here and from these statements of the ulama we find that it's clear from the belief of the Muslims from the belief that is correct in the issue of leadership and following the leaders and that is that it is compulsory on all of the Muslims to obey all of their leaders it's compulsory for the Muslims to obey all of their leaders whether they're in the uh, whether they're the Imams or the Amirs or the President or whoever that are in charge of the affairs of the Muslims it is compulsory on the Muslims to obey them except in disobedience to Allah Taala. it is not permissible for any of the Muslims to disobey them or to try to overthrow them or to usurp or to take from them their leadership this is what has been established from the statements of the ulama and this is the position of the people who are on the truth and on the issue of leadership and this is that which we believe in and this is that which we hope to meet Allah wa ta'ala on and this is what we are calling the Muslims to believe in and to follow and to call the rest of the Muslims to practice however unfortunately we see uh, as we practice Islam or try to practice Islam in America that the majority or a large portion of the Muslims who say that they are on the Sunnah or the Muslims who say that we are the Salafiyun or we are the Salafis we see that we lack in the application of this part of the Aqidah that we say is correct and we find that the other people who we point our finger at and we call them the deviants they seem to understand this position of leadership and obedience to their leaders this point of obedience to the leaders and obeying the leaders and not overthrowing them and not trying to take or to compete with them for their leadership this is the position of the Muslims and the people on the Sunnah we should be the first people to practice this before the rest of the Muslims practice it as we are the ones that are claiming to follow the Quran and the Sunnah and that which was practiced and understood of it the Quran and the Sunnah by our rightly, rightly guided predecessors this point of leadership and following the leaders we have to get an understanding of it and we have to begin to practice it in our lives because inshallah ta'ala this is going to set the tone for the spread of Islam in America inshallah ta'ala uh, also while we're mentioning this point we want to make it clear to the people as I've heard unfortunately many times uh, especially when it comes to the people who have been who have given the bay'ah to their particular imam or the people who actually listen and obey their imam that us the people who claim to be on the sunnah that we point our fingers to them as if they aren't practicing Islam because of their obedience to their leaders and we say how stupid is it for someone to follow his leader like that this following of the leaders the way that these people especially the people who have they are the way that they obey their leader and follow their leader this is from Islam and this is what the ulama of Islam are trying to establish for us in our belief and when we look at them we need to be the last people looking at that practice of obedience to the leaders as if there's something foreign to Islam and particular to a particular group this is from Islam and until we realize it and start to live up to it how are we going to unite and to work with the Muslims who are obeying their leaders this is an important point for us and I've talked with some of the Imams uh, in America about this point and we all understood that it's important for the people to understand this point 
And when we do, we can see that in the future, inshallah ta'ala, there will be more working between the imams and more spreading of Islam in America. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that. However, and I don't want to uh, be mistaken, that if in the future, inshallah ta'ala, if we understand this point and we begin to practice this point and that we're able to sit down with and to try to come together and work with the rest of the Muslims who do not claim that they follow the Qur'an and the Sunnah on the understanding of the Salaf that the first topic or the first issue that we would discuss is the issue of following, is practicing Islam from the Qur'an and the Sunnah on the understanding of our rightly guided predecessors. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, establishes for us this belief of obeying the leaders and not disobeying them and not overthrowing them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala establishes this for us in the Quran as he says in Surah Al-Nisa Ya ayuha al-lazina amanu wa ati'u Allah wa ati'u al-rasool wa uli al-amri minkum O you who believe I command you to obey Allah and I command you to obey the messenger and those who are in a charge from among you or those in authority from among you Abu Huraira rahimahu radiallahu anhu he explains that those who are in authority from among you from among the Muslims they are the umara or the leaders they are the leaders those people who are in charge of the affairs of the Muslims these are the people that are meant by Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala's statement, I command you to obey Allah and I command you to obey the Messenger and those in authority from among you, meaning whoever is in leadership position from among the Muslims. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says that what is meant by this statement, those who are in authority from among you, it means the people of fiqh and the people of deen, referring to the ulama, the people who have an understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah, just as his student Mujahid, he says that they are the people of fiqh and ilm. They are the people of knowledge and the people of understanding of this deen. Just as Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, he says that they are the scholars. We see that from this ayah that Allah tabarak wa ta'ala is commanding the believers to obey their leaders and also those people of knowledge or deen as Ibn Abbas and Mujahid and Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah have explained and that this is important for the Muslims to understand and not to think that this is something foreign to Islam and particular to some of the groups some of the sects or whatever that the Muslims have broken off from the Jama'ah and established that this is a part of their belief and not a part of the belief of the Muslims but it's a part of the belief of the Muslims to obey the leaders and to obey the knowledgeable people from among the Muslims. As the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has established for us in many authentic hadith as he does in this hadith of Al-Bukhari a Muslim where he says Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Isma'u wa ati'u wa in istu'amila alaykum abdun habashiyun kana ra'suhu zabiba The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says I command you to hear and obey even if an Abyssinian slave has been made your leader and his head is like a raisin. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also says <coughs> in the other authentic hadith collected by Al-Bukhari and Muslim, hearing and obeying is compulsory on every Muslim. On the uh, issues that he likes and the affairs that he dislikes so long he, as he is not commanded to commit a sin. And if he is commanded to commit a sin, then there is no listening or obeying. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this hadith is also showing us that it is compulsory on every Muslim to hear and obey those people who are in charge of him. Just as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in the other hadith of Al-Bukhari and Muslim مَنْ أَطَاعَنِي فَقَدْ عَطَاءَ اللَّهِ وَمَنْ أَطَاعَنِي فَقَدْ عَطَاءَ اللَّهِ وَمَنْ يُطِعِ الْأَمِيرِ فَقَدْ عَطَاءَنِي وَمَنْ يَعْفِ الْأَمِيرِ فَقَدْ عَطَاءَنِي the Messenger of Allah says, whoever obeys me has obeyed Allah. Whoever obeys me has obeyed Allah. And whoever disobeys me has disobeyed Allah. And whoever obeys an, a, a leader, an Amir, 
then he has obeyed me and whoever disobeys the leader has disobeyed me. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in these authentic hadith is trying to establish that which Allah tabarak wa ta'ala has established for us in that ayah that which the ulama are telling us that it is compulsory on us to obey the Muslim leaders. Just as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says in the narration of Imam Muslim which might be a little closer to us in Ummira alaykum abdun mujadda'un aswad yaqoodukum bi kitabillah the Messenger of Allah says, even if a slave who is mutilated and black, if he has been appointed as your leader and he is leading you by the book of Allah, then I command you to listen to him and obey him. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, <coughs> uh, goes on to detail for us that type of obedience to our leaders as he says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the hadith of al-Bukhari Muslim man ra'a min amirihi shay'an yakrahuhu fal yasbir fa innahu man faraqa al-jama'a shibran fa mata illa mata nitatan jahiliya the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says and whoever sees something in his leader that he dislikes I command him to be patient because indeed whoever leaves the jama'ah by a hand span, a shibr, then when he dies, he dies the death of Jahiliya. Here the Messenger of Allah alayhi wa is showing us that which we see in some of the groups and that is that they obey their leader even though they don't like it. They may see something in their leader and we're pointing out, well your leader does this or your leader's like this, how can you follow a man like that? Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he has commanded us to follow the leaders even if we see something in them that we dislike because that thing we have to be patient with and we have to obey them as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam commanded us because this obedience to the leaders is leaving the jama'ah the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam puts this very clear in the narration of Imam Muslim as he says in Barba Zahrak wa akhada malaka fasma' wa atir if he beats your back and he takes your money, I command you to listen to him and to obey him. If he beats your back and takes your money, of course unjustly, I command you to listen to him and to obey him. Here the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is laying it out and we see this, but we don't see this being practiced by the people who claim to be on the Sunnah, that they're obedient and that they're following to the leaders we don't see that it's like some of the other groups who are actually following and listening to their leaders the way that the people on the Sunnah should be following and listening to their leaders. As many of the people unfortunately who have deviated from the straight path, they think that a part of being on the Sunnah is being unorganized. They think that being on the Sunnah means following no leadership. As the people on the Sunnah have not established in their being the following of leadership. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam shows us even how far to go in obeying our leaders as this narration of Ubadah ibn Samad, Samad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, دَعَانَا النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَبَايَعْنَاهُ فَكَانَ فِي مَا خَذْنَا عَلَيْهِ عَلَيْنَا أَنْ يُبَايِعْنَا عَلَى السَّمْعِ وَطَاعَ فِي مَنْ شَطِهْنَا ومكرهنا وعسرنا ويسرنا وأثرة علينا وأن لا ننازي الأمر أهلا إلا أن تروا كفرا بواحا عندكم من الله فيه برهان And this is collected by Al-Bukhari Muslim وعبادة مصام رضي الله تعالى عنه He said that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم called us to give the day to him and among the things that we gave the bay'ah to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on was that we gave him bay'ah that we would hear and we would obey. While we were active in the things that we liked and even the things that we disliked. In hard times and in easy times, whether it was against ourselves or not, we would obey him. And we would not compete or we would not disobey the leaders. 
except that we saw clear kufr that we had proof from Allah tabarak wa ta'ala about. So here the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is showing us that the obedience to the leader goes so far to everything so long as you don't have clear proof from Allah tabarak wa ta'ala that that leader is a kafir. And so long as he's not a kafir with your clear proof from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, then that person must be obeyed so long as he is among the leaders of the Muslims. The message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this next narration of Imam Muslim, he says, خِيَارُ أَئِمَّتِكُمُ الَّذِينَ تُحِبُّونَهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَكُمْ وَتُصَلُّونَ عَلَيْهُمْ وَيُصَلُّونَ عَلَيْكُمْ وَشِرَارُ أَئِمَّتِكُمُ الَّذِينَ تُبْغُونَهُمْ وَيُبْغِضُونَكُمْ وَتَلْعَنُونَهُمْ وَيَلْعَنُونَكُمْ فَقُلْنَا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَفَلَا نُنَابِذْهُمْ بِالسَّيْفِ عِنْدَ ذَلِكْ قَالَ لَا مَا أَقَامُوا فِيكُمْ الصَّلَاةِ أَلَا مَنْ وَلِيَ عَلَيْهِ وَالٍ فَرَآهُ يَأْتِي شَيْئًا مِنْ مَعْصِيَةِ اللَّهِ فَلْيَكْرَهُ مَا يَأْتِي مِنْ مَعْصِيَةِ اللَّهِ وَلَا يُنَا وَلَا يَنْزِ عَنَّ يَدًا مِنْ طَاعَةٍ The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the best leaders from among you are the ones that you love and they love you. You make dua for them and they make dua for you. And the worst leaders from among you are the ones that you hate and they hate you. And you curse them and they curse you. So we said, Ya Rasulullah, shouldn't we overthrow them with the sword when we see that they are the worst leaders? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, No, so long as they establish the Salat amongst you. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went on to say, And whoever has a leader in charge of him, and he sees something in his leader from that which is disobedience to Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, then he should hate to do something that is in disobedience to Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, but he should never disobey that leader. Here in this hadith of Imam Muslim, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is making it clear to us, no matter what the circumstances are, so long as that leader is a Muslim and he establishes the Salah, then it is compulsory for the people to obey him. And that there's, it is not permissible, it is prohibited for the people to overthrow him, like it or not. Find difficulty in obeying him or not, the Messenger of Allah has commanded the believers to follow the leaders in this manner. And these, as we see, are from hadith that are in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, and Sahih Muslim, or in both of them together, as this next hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the authority of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu ta'ala anhu who said, بعث النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ثريه وأمر عليهم رجلا من الأنصار وأمرهم أن يطيعوه فغضب عليهم وقال أليس قد أمر النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أن تطيعوني قالوا بلى قال قد عزمت عليكم لما جمعتم حطبا وأوقدتم نارا ثم دخلتم فيها فجمعوا حطبا فأوقدوا نارا فلما هموا بالدخول فقاموا ينظر بعضهم إلى بعض فقال بعضهم إنما تبعنا النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فرارا من النار أفندخلها فبينما هم كذلك إذ خدمت النار وسكن غضبه فذكر للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال لو دخلوها ما خرجوا منها أبدا إنما الطاعة في المعروف In this hadith collected by Imam al-Bukhari the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم is showing us even though we have been commanded to obey our leaders Whoever the leaders are, as the Messenger of Allah والسلام, had given the example of an Abyssinian slave who was black with a head like a raisin, and that this uh, was showing that, <clears throat> as sometimes the people even use today to show uh, the worst among the people, to show whoever is your leader, you have to obey him. In good times and bad times, in the affairs that you like, in the affairs that you dislike, and even if he does something, that is sinful, you just have to be patient with that and not to do it yourself, but you have to obey him and stay away from 
disobedience to him. The message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is showing us that we have to go to every length to obey our leaders. And this is a part of the belief of the Muslims, that we have to obey the leaders. But here in, the message, here in this hadith of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he shows us that nobody is stupid and nobody is crazy and that nobody is going to follow his leader to the hellfire after he has accepted Islam. As Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu shows us in this authentic hadith, as he says, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent a raiding party. And he commanded one of the men to be the leaders of that raiding party, and he was a man from among the Ansar. He told the people to obey him. So he, the leader had got mad during the, uh, when they went out for the raiding party. He said, didn't the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam command you all to obey me? They said, of course. He said, then, you know, I want you all to get some wood and to start a fire, and then I want you all to enter into that fire. So they gathered the wood, they lit it up, started the fire, and then when it was time for them to jump in the fire, they started looking at one another. Until one of them said, listen, we only follow the prophet in order to get out of the hellfire. You tell me we're going to enter into it now? At any rate, while they were in this state, looking at one another and thinking this thing over, the fire had went out and the leader's anger had went away. And then later on they mentioned it to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, if you would have entered into the fire, you would have never ever got out of the fire. Obedience is only in those things that are right. Obedience is only in those things that are right. We see here from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam that if the leader is leading us down the path of darkness or the path of the hellfire, that no one's going to follow the leader in that. No one's going to follow the leader when he's commanding us to do disobedience. However, every other commandment of his, we're going to obey him. And we can look at it to take uh, an example that might be closer to us. If uh, we were sleeping and the leader, he called us at 2.30 in the morning and he said, come here, I want you to go hang these flyers up on a telephone pole. He told him, it's 2.30 in the morning, I'm asleep. Whenever the leader commands you to do something, you have to do it. And even though that leader himself, you know that he's a sinner and he's commanding you to get up in the middle of the night and to go do something that you don't see any benefit in it, you have to obey that leader because he's not commanding you to do a sin. He's not telling you when Salat al-Asr is established, he tells the Muslims nobody can make Salat in the Masjid today. We're not establishing the Salat. Nobody's going to obey him, he's just going to go to the Masjid anyway and to establish the Salat. As no one is going to obey the leader in disobedience to Allah wa ta'ala. But if the leader is commanding others in disobedience to Allah wa ta'ala, no one has an excuse not to obey him. That the issue is trivial or I don't like it or so on and so forth. As the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has established for us clearly in this hadith, and there are many hadith that we could read them all day to show the importance of obeying the leader and that we have to go to as to the length of obeying the leader and that the only time we can disobey him if he commands us to do something that is disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like I heard one of the imams who told the people when they were invited to go to Africa don't go to the Africa Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us that the right over a Muslim is six. The right of a Muslim over a Muslim is six. And he mentioned among them if he invites you to accept it. This is the right of the Muslim. No leader can take away that right of the Muslim. And whoever obeys a leader in disobedience to Allah, he has taken his leader as a Lord besides Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited this as he tells us in Surah Tawbah about the people who have come before us اتخذوا أحبارهم ورهدانهم أربابا من دون الله والمسيح بن مريم وما أمروا إلا ليعبدوا إلها واحدا 
from the sunnah. Here Allah tabarakhu wa ta'ala is telling us in the Quran, He is showing us that if we were to obey our leaders in this obedience to Allah tabarakhu wa ta'ala, that this is the shirk of taking them as God and deities besides Allah, and we'll continue after the salah inshaAllah ta'ala. أشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد لما سنجى الله صلى الله عليه وسلم he was reading this last verse that we had quoted and they have taken their priests and rabbis as lords besides Allah and Adi ibn Hatim رضي الله تعالى عنه who used to be a Christian before he accepted Islam with the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم he told the prophet we didn't take our priests and rabbis as lords besides Allah the Prophet of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam asked him, if Allah had made something permissible and your priests and rabbis made it haram, would you make that thing haram? He said yes. The Prophet wasalam, said, if Allah had made something haram and your priests and rabbis made it permissible, would you make it permissible? He said yes. The Prophet wasalam, said that is the worship of them. And we see from this that if we follow our leaders and disobedience to Allah wa ta'ala or his messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam that this is the shirk of taking them as Lord besides Allah Taala, and that this obedience to the leaders never goes to the point of disobeying Allah and disobeying the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Sallam So we see that the ulama of Islam have established in their aqeedahs and we know that the people of the Sunnah are the people who put the most importance on our aqeedah as we know the its place in Islam and that we see that in the aqeedahs of the people of the sunnah that they have this position of obedience to the leaders and not trying to overthrow the leaders following them and obeying them in everything except disobedience to Allah tabarak wa ta'ala no matter who that leader is. We find that this with this is that which is, has been established from the Book of Allah and from the Sunnah of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sahbi Wa Sallam. Now it's just upon us, the people of the Sunnah to practice it. And the first thing that comes to most of our minds is that we feel that we are under leaders who are corrupt or we are under leaders who are oppressive or we are under leaders who are ignorant or we are under leaders all of the way that we describe these leaders with these terms that aren't permissible for us to use in the description of our leaders as Muslims even if they fit these descriptions we use this as an excuse to disobey Allah Taala and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by not obeying the leaders especially the leaders of the masjid in our particular area. It's compulsory on the people of the Sunnah and the rest of the Muslims not to use any excuses when it comes to obeying their leaders, but just to be among those people who say we hear and we obey. And that we hope that this position that we have believed in already before we heard this talk we hope that this position will be practiced, inshallah ta'ala, so that the other Muslims who we point the fingers at and say that they are a little off the path or whatever we have to say, that they would know that the position of the people of the Sunnah is to follow leadership. Whether that leadership is corrupt or correct, we have been commanded to follow that leadership whether we like it or we don't whether it's difficult or easy, we have been commanded to follow the leadership except in those affairs that are disobedience to Allah. And if we follow them in disobedience to Allah, that this is taking them as Lord besides Allah tabarakwa ta'ala and this is shirk and we have been prohibited and this is what the ummahs or the nations that have come before us have fell into. The next thing that we think of is if we follow the corrupt leaders, how is that going to change our situation? How is that going to change our situation? 
Uh, this flimsy excuse that we use to disobey our leaders, we should know that corrupt leaders are just the result of the corrupt Muslims. Our leaders are only reflective of us. And we know this as Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu when the people tried to accuse him of saying look at all of the corruption during your leadership Ali ibn Abi Talib it wasn't like that during the time of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu he told them Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman they were leaders over people like me and I'm, lead and I'm the leader over people like you this corruption that we see from the leaders it's from our own self. We're not practicing this deen like we're supposed to. We think that being on the sunnah is just lip service. We need to be the first people to obey the leaders, whether those leaders practice this deen correctly or not, whether they're ignorant or knowledgeable, whether the leaders are weak or strong, good or bad. We have been commanded, we have been commanded to obey the leaders and that this is a part of Islam. The other point that we want to get across is that those leaders, now that they know this, no one has to be threatened of the knowledge. No leader has to be threatened of the students of knowledge or the people of knowledge to come into their masjid and to teach the deen of Islam so that the people could practice the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Why? Because they know no one can challenge their leadership and that knowledge just because a person is knowledgeable doesn't give him the right to challenge someone's leadership doesn't give him the right to take someone's leadership doesn't give the people the right to rally around that person because of his knowledge to overthrow or to take someone's leadership. The people who are the leaders and the Muslims have agreed and have chosen those people as the leaders, they are the leaders. And as for this term that the people say, yeah, so-and-so is the leader for life. You got a problem with that? If Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala has allowed a person to be a leader, he's a leader. And if he's a leader for life, alhamdulillah. We, we're not uh, uh, democratic or Worshipping Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala on democracy as if every four years there has to be another leader or it's not fair as the people need to be more involved in choosing the leader and so on and so forth. Once the person has become the leader, case is closed. It's just upon us to follow. And when we, the people of the Sunnah, began to practice this belief that we claim that we have and to show the rest of the Muslims real obedience to the leaders, then the leaders inshallah ta'ala won't feel threatened by the people of knowledge of coming into their masjid and spreading the sunnah. And we're advising the leaders that uh, uh, the, the people who have children on the ladies side, could they keep their children down because uh, women are complaining and they're leaving the lecture hall saying that they can't hear the talk. The leaders, now that they understand that the people on the sunnah, that they understand what is leadership and how the leader is supposed to be obeyed and that this is from Islam and that not any of these imams have invented this obedience to them. And we know that some people even complain that the imam, he uses these verses in order to get the people to obey him. Or he uses these hadiths of the Prophet ﷺ to get the people to obey him. People are actually talking like this, like it's a crime. That the Imam uses the Hadith in order to guide the people. That the Imam who uses the Ayah in order to guide the people. They think that it's a crime because it's in benefit of the Imam. If the Quran or the Book of Allah, the Book of Allah or the Sunnah of His Messenger wasallam benefits you, then you're benefited. We know this is the same complaint that the sisters make against us. Why are your brothers always talking about three wives and two wives? Because Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala establishes this. And we can quote the ayah any time we want to defend our position. And those people who are in our leadership, they have dozens and dozens of hadiths to support 
why you should obey them and why you have no excuse for disobeying them. We need to establish this type of obedience to the leaders of the Muslims so that the leaders of the Muslims can stop feeling threatened so that the knowledgeable people can come to the masjid and teach the deen. And the knowledgeable people at times, they need to be reminded of their belief that they have no right to overthrow that imam and they have no right to rally the people up to overthrow that imam and they have no right to disobey that imam. Don't tell anybody or the imam or whoever that you know so much and the imam doesn't know anything. How are you going to follow the ignorance? Because of your deeds and the deeds of the people with you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen to put the ignorant as your leader. And you have to obey them except in disobedience to Allah. And that this deen, alhamdulillah, this deen is the truth and it's correct and there's nothing foolish in Islam as we saw from the example of the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Wasallam, where the person said, okay, Allah's Messenger Wasallam told you to obey me, obey me and jump in that fire. We're not going to jump in the fire for anybody and no one's calling anyone to follow some ignorant people into the hellfire. But we're saying everything else that they command you to do, you have to obey. And there's no excuse for these people, unfortunately, and we get the calls from the people of the Sunnah, always complaining about Masjid so-and-so and Masjid so-and-so and how the leadership there and the people there aren't practicing the Sunnah. If you, if we as Muslims weren't sinners, then Allah Taala wouldn't have pleased these people that we don't feel are, are worthy of this leadership over top of us. However, Allah Taala has done what He has done, and the people who are the leaders are the leaders, and we have been commanded to obey them and to follow them. We've also uh, been commanded to advise the leaders. And we want to advise the leaders and ask the brothers and the sisters to advise the leaders to let the people of knowledge come in the masjid and teach people Islam. <coughs> and that there's nothing against the imam or the leader or the emir or the board or whatever. If they don't have the ability to teach something, you just bring the people in. But don't let the people go 10 years, 5 years not learning nothing about Islam because you feel that your leadership is threatened. You have enough ayat and you have enough hadith that you shouldn't feel threatened about your leadership because you have enough to back you up as a leader. Use these hadith and use these ayat to back yourself up and then bring the knowledgeable people in and tell them to teach anything you like. Teach the people the deen, show the people the truth from the falsehood. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded the people to learn from the people of knowledge as Allah tells us فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ I command you to ask the people of knowledge when you don't know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to ask the people of dhikr, ahl dhikr, the people of, of revelation, the people who have knowledge of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. We have been commanded to ask them when we don't know. We accepted Islam yesterday, we don't know. And we have to ask them, those people who know, so we can. And the imams or the leaders or the emirs or the boards or whatever, they shouldn't stand in the way of the people who have knowledge. As there is no <coughs> uh, opposition between leadership and knowledge in Islam, as we see from that ayat that we had started it off with, O oh, you who believe, I command you to obey Allah and I command you to obey the messenger and those from authority among you that they mean the leaders and the people of knowledge and that there is no opposition between the two that each group they have their <coughs> each group they have their role to play the people of knowledge teach the deen and the people of leadership lead the Muslims so that we can lead this ummah in harmony so this uh, <coughs> talk was to show the people of leadership that no one has come to take their leadership and that they shouldn't be threatened by the people of knowledge or by the books of knowledge or by the tape of knowledge 
they should allow them to enter into their masjids, the people of knowledge, the tapes, the books, so that the Muslims can learn their deen. Because unfortunately, too many of the masjids don't have any classes, don't have any bookstore, don't have any tape library, don't have any pamphlets or information in order to teach the Muslims their deen. How long can we go being ignorant just because we fear losing our leadership position? You have enough hadith and enough ayat to uh, back you up as being your leader. And we the people of the sunnah, <coughs> we want to be the first people to follow the leaders. And we want to teach the rest of the Muslims that they have to obey and follow the leaders, whether they like it or not, except for those things that are disobedient to Allah, until we establish, inshallah ta'ala, real leadership and real knowledge in our masjid, inshallah. This is uh, what I wanted to offer as advice to the leaders and to the masses of the Muslims. Walhamdulillah wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. We had a question. Is it my understanding that we are to follow our righteous predecessors in belief? actions, worship, and methodology. Thus, I would like to ask, why are there Salafi masjids with board of directors and imams, emirs with contracts, board of directors are not comparable to shura because the board directs and does not advise. And if it's a matter of semantics, then why aren't Salafi masjids employing Arabic and Islamic terms. Uh, as far as following the Salaf, uh, I think that everyone understands that and hopefully the brother Dawud Ji will arrive uh, even if it's late to handle that topic that he was uh, scheduled to handle in defense of Al-Dahi and the Salafi Da'wah and to deal with that more. However, this issue of the board of directors and the Imams and the Amirs with contracts and so on and so forth, that the Messenger of Allah alayhi wa salatu wa salam, he tells us in an authentic hadith, al-Muslimoon ala surutihim, the Muslims are on the conditions that they agree upon, and that if the Muslims agree that such and such is okay, and it's a better way to help them manage and run their affairs, then it's perfectly permissible. And someone has to show us in Islam why this isn't permissible. As far as employing Arabic and Islamic terminology, I think that uh, everywhere, inshallah ta'ala, when the knowledge comes and the people begin to learn the Arabic language, that we would see more of the using of Arabic terminology instead of English terminology. But until that time comes, what are we going to do? If I were to give the talk in Arabic to say we need to start using some Arabic terminology, only a few of the brothers will be able to understand and the rest of the people will be looking at, at me like I'm crazy. Don't you know that we speak English? Or do you just want to show off that you know Arabic or so on and so forth? That's what we want to do by using Arabic terms where the people don't know. We want to speak in the language that the people understand. And when the people, inshallah, begin to understand Arabic more, we use the Arabic terminology to the level that the people understand and we're always in trying to encourage and teach the Muslims the Arabic language so that inshallah we could eventually uh, start employing some more Arabic terms whether we can begin to conversate and to speak with one another in Arabic inshallah Assalamu alaikum this is Brother Fulk from St. Louis Wa alaikum salam wa salam wa salam I have one question regarding your uh, topic okay would it be safe to go to a particular master say that would be under the leadership of Walter Dean Muhammad or under the Shia, even if they make statements of kufr or deviate from the Sunnah, as long as we don't follow them in those acts, and when they make statements like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you know, introduced us to Islam and etc. If we go there and address them and they still, you know, reject it and believe it's correct even though it's proven incorrect, should we still go to that master or should we just, you know, move on elsewhere? Okay, first of all, if the masjid is a Shia masjid, we want to ask them. 
Are you all on this Ja'afari Mazhar as most of the Shia are on and they believe in the 12th Imam? If they say no, then we know this is a place of kufr and there's no need to go in it at all. So that's firstly. Okay. And that's not, it's just like saying the temple of those nation of kufr, uh, should we go or not? I mean, the outside of Islam, there's no discussion. It's like talking about, should you go to a church five times a day to establish the salah? As far as the masjid of war be Muhammad, if there's no other masjid in your area except this masjid, and there's no other leader in your area except that leader, then you have to go to that masjid five times a day and establish the salah, and you have to obey that imam, and whatever he commands you, accept disobedience to Allah. Okay, to Allah Can you please admonish and advise the sisters to lower their voices and have some consideration for the sisters who came for the sole intention to hear the lecture? Shukran. What proof do you have stating that the people are to follow a leader even if he is evil? That would seem like oppression and we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made oppression haram for himself. I just don't see why we should follow someone even if he is evil or corrupt. Uh, the ulama of Islam from the beginning up until today they all say, or many of them say in their books of Aqidah, as we have mentioned, that they follow the leader even if he is corrupt. Now we mentioned the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, even if he beat you unjustly and took your money unjustly, I command you to listen to him and to obey him. This is from Islam and there is no oppression in Islam. The oppression is all of those sins we keep committing and this is why we have those leaders. And there was a verse, you know, and it has split my mind, and uh, maybe it'll come to me before uh, the end of the question and answer session, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just showing us that only oppression that we have against ourselves is that which our own hands have brought. We know every day we sin. Wallahi, the Muslims, as we just look at the sin of imitating the disbelievers, if we look at the sin of riba, if we look at the sin of living freely amongst the kuffar, if we look at the sin of taking our enemies as friends, if we just look at that alone, this is why we're in the situation that we're in. And when we turn to Allah and repent to Allah and practice Islam the way it's supposed to be practiced, then we can see that there's no oppression in Islam. This is from the wisdom of Al-Hakim, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala the wise. This is his wisdom, he's made it in charge. He's made it this way, and this is the way it is, and there's no oppression, whether you think it's oppression or not. And this just reminds me of the case where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a man come to him and say, my brother some is sick uh, with stomach problems. So the Prophet Sallallahu told him, go drink honey because it's a cure. He came back and said, my brother drunk honey, and he's still sick in his stomach. Prophet ﷺ said, go tell him to drink some honey. He had drunk some more honey, and he came back to the Prophet ﷺ the second time and said, he still is sick. The Prophet ﷺ said, go tell him to drink some honey, because Allah said it's a cure, and your brother's stomach is lying, tell him to drink some honey. And he drunk the honey, and he was cured. This being is the truth. Whether your intellect can handle it or not, this deen is the truth. Whether your stomach try to tell you that the honey didn't cure you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't lie. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nothing comes off of his tongue except the truth. We should be like the people who came before us. When we talk about the people who came before us, the first people that they questioned were themselves. And we know this about the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wa radiallahu ta'ala anhum when the issue of the munafiq came about they weren't looking at the next people they were looking at themselves to find out am I, am I among the munafiq? But here we are the biggest sinners of the Muslims ever since the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
And we know that the Prophet ﷺ told us that there never comes a generation except that the one after it is worse than it. We're the worst generation of all of the Muslims and we're wondering why our leadership is the way it is. Nobody is oppressing anyone except us oppressing ourselves. In our masjid we have an imam, an amir, and a board, and we have branches off of the board. Who are we supposed to obey? Every single one of them. Everybody who has leadership, a leadership position, we have been commanded to obey them. And we saw it from the text, and we saw it from the statements of the ulama, that everyone that is in leadership position, we obey them. I mean, here we're living in the Kafir country, and we don't understand how far this issue of leadership can go. But let's just try to imagine, as we always do, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our imagination the truth, that we are living in a Muslim community. We are living in a Muslim society. We are living on a Muslim street, which is in a Muslim city, which is in a Muslim state, which is in a Muslim country. All of the houses are Muslim, all of the schools are Muslim schools, all of the businesses are Muslim businesses, all of the corporations and companies are Muslim corporations and countries, all of the government buildings are Muslim government buildings, all of the policemen are Muslim policemen, everybody in the street is a Muslim. Let's just try to imagine we're like this. The people who are in charge of traffic, we have to obey them, who make the traffic laws and set up that department. The people of social services, the people of sanitation, the people of whatever uh, aspect of leadership that the Muslims might be in, we have to obey them as all of them are part of those in authority from among you. Any type of authority among the Muslims that the people are in charge, we have to obey them, and this is from the Deen of Islam. What are your views of the minhaj of Hizb al-Tahat? Tahrir approach on to establishing an Islamic state. Uh, unfortunately, I've only had the chance to uh, study a little bit of Islam and I haven't had the chance to study deviance. And I don't see the benefit of trying to learn some deviance. Well, I tried to learn some of the Quran and the Sunnah and we want to try to teach the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and if we learn that, then we don't have to worry about anything else because we compare whatever comes to us to this. As far as the Hizb al-Tahrir, I don't know anything about their approach or their establishing anything. And if I've heard it in the past, I try my best to forget it because it won't benefit me and the only thing that will benefit me is this deen of Islam. How do you correct the Imam who is involved in clear and outrageous bid'ah? <laughs> <laughs> i.e. putting photographs and paintings up in the masjid <laughs> and establishing holidays we do as we begin this talk on al-deen al nasiha we advise the imam this is what is upon the muslim to advise quote them some ayat quote them some hadith show them that which is correct and then shut up and obey them. This is what is upon the believers. So believe me, there's no message, there's no community, there's no place, the people are just correct and on the sunnah and the leader isn't. Where's that at? Nowhere. The people just like the leader. Rather the people worse than the leader. Look at our leaders. We can talk about the leaders all we want to and the imams and what have you, but people know these leaders and these imams, they've only been placed there because they were the best people in the community. And don't act like they weren't the best people in the community and this is why you had chosen. These people have been around 10 years, 15 years, whatever. They did their best to learn whatever they could and this is why they were the leaders. I think that the first thing we should do is to check ourselves. And if we, if uh, we as individuals uh, have gotten our deen together to a particular level then we should say Alhamdulillah we should just say Alhamdulillah but it's only upon us to advise and then to be quiet after that to advise and to be quiet after that if you have a question 
and your husband says that he has to see it first. But do I have to show it to him? <laughs> What if I don't want him to know, to know what I'm asking? Uh, we were just mentioning this earlier, that the men have been commanded to... <laughs> the men have been commanded to treat the women kindly. Yes, the men are in charge of their families, and what we say goes. Like it's sister or not, that's what goes. But the brothers, just because it's like that, the brothers shouldn't be oppressive and just try to let the sister know that it's like that. Oh, her Lord Taala has made it clear for her that her husband is in charge. You don't have to constantly remind her and beat the sister down or whatever. But sister, maybe you should look at uh, or ask your husband maybe he has a particular reason and maybe it's for your own benefit if uh, you show him what your question is and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that could you respect what you mentioned can you repeat what you mentioned pertaining to overthrowing your leader it's not permissible to overthrow the leader and we mentioned the hadith of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa that shows us it's not permissible to overthrow the leader also what happened in the case of the community overthrowing Dawood Adib Jazakallahu Khairan uh, this is a statement of falsehood and I don't know any statement more falser than this falsehood that I just read also what happened in the case of the community overthrowing Dawood Adib Dawood Adib he made a public address to the people and he let the people know that there was no malicious uh, activity going on there were no secret hidden agendas there were nothing he was completely and totally happy and satisfied with what took place. He had a contract with the Islamic son of Isarin, the Islamic son of Isarin, they fulfilled their contract with uh, Imam Dawood all the way to the end of his contract. Nothing uh, was, nothing uh, fell short from the Islamic son of Isarin and Imam Dawood ad was not overthrown. His contract was uh, over and it wasn't renewed. So these people that uh, continue, unfortunately, to uh, spread this type of falsehood, I don't know why they don't listen to Imam Dawood himself, who spoke on numerous occasions publicly to the people to let them know, no one tricked me, no one forced me, no one did anything against me, that everything went okay, and I'm happy, and if you ain't happy, that's your problem. And we'll see that people still have a problem. If someone wants to be in the defense of his brother or sister in Islam, then we should try to do it with that which is best and that which is truthful. Go to the brother and ask him, is there anything wrong or is there something done uncorrect, uh, that wasn't correct. We know, alhamdulillah, in Islam that the sunnah is being taught, the Quran is being taught, alhamdulillah, and the people are doing their best to practice Islam. And we know for a certainty that overthrowing the leaders of the Muslims is not permissible in any circumstances. So uh, I think that person needs to stand corrected. I am a sister who is not afraid of polygamy because my husband maintains me at a comfortable level. I think sisters are afraid of getting jerked, not maintained. I will go through my natural emotions like any other woman but any woman in her right mind will not leave her husband who treats her with kindness and pays all the bills. Islam is beautiful. I accept polygamy. So brothers, accept your responsibility. What if a jama'ah feels that its leader is showing signs of S-E-N-I-L-I-T-Y, senility, whatever, going senile. Uh, he's the leader. What do you want from him? You have to hear and to obey him. And what point in terms of getting old, thinking, process, deteriorate,
does an imam become unqualified or unacceptable? The Prophet ﷺ was the leader of the Muslims until he died. Abu Bakr and al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu was the leader of the Muslims until he died. Uh, Uthman ibn Asan radiallahu ta'ala anhu he was the leader of the Muslims until he died. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu he was the leader of the Muslims until he died. Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan he was the leader of the Muslims until he died. We can go all the way on up to Omar ibn Abi. Uh, Omar uh, Abd- Ibn Abdul Aziz, he was the leader of the Muslims until he died. And that many of the leaders of the Muslims, they were the leaders until they died. Do we have a problem with that? Or we just use with this kufr and democracy and we can't just accept Islam? And this is only a sign that we need to leave the land of the disbelievers and go to the land of the believers so we can understand Islam in its totality. Because it's like... Uh, article I read a long time ago before I accepted Islam called uh, looking through the world looking at the world through Muslim eyes or something like that from the plain truth magazine we looking at Islam through Kafir eyes we're not even looking at Islam through Muslim eyes because we never lived with the Muslims we never lived with the Muslims we never was on a Muslim street most of us never been in a Muslim apartment building or a Muslim house, or a Muslim state, or a Muslim city, or a Muslim nothing. Not even a Muslim school. And we see, as the brother was mentioning today, the Muslim schools are in need of help because the majority of the Muslims are still sending their children to the Kufar school, talking about what deen they're teaching them when they come home. They ain't teaching them no deen because they don't know no deen. They don't even go to the masjid. That's why he don't send his children to the school. I think that uh, <clears throat> we just need to accept Islam like it is. We can bring our thing, uh Senility, we can bring ignorance, arrogance, stupidity, whatever we want to bring doesn't change the hadith of the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I command you to listen and to obey even if a slave has been placed above you as your leader. If a community elects an Amir and some brothers force him out, would the brother that was Amir still be the Amir of that community? No. Uh, I think it was mentioned, and if not, we'll mention it now. Once a person becomes a leader, no matter how he became the leader, by rightful means or an un, uh, or a wrong overthrowing, once he becomes the leader, case closed, he's the leader, what went for the one before him goes for him. Those people who overthrew him or pushed him out or kicked him out or whatever, those people, they got to carry that sin and repent to Allah. But that new one, he's the leader and he has to be obeyed just like the one came before them. And this is what the ulama of Islam, they mention in their books of Aqidah to show us that whether a person became the leader by the consensus of the people or because they overthrew the previous government once he becomes the leader whether it was rightfully or in the wrong way he's the leader now and all of those texts go for him like it who likes it and don't like it who don't like it this is the deen of Islam and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the strength to practice it if there's no more questions we'll just end it here inshallah ta'ala is it permissible to let your wife go out without her hijab no. How are you going to let your wife go out? Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala tells us, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. O you who believe, I command you to save yourselves and your families from the fire. This is enough for all of the men to know nobody and nothing in their household should be going against Islam. Tell those children you're going to practice Islam. I see you coming to the masjid with me. When I come to the masjid, like it or not. If you don't like it, live in somebody else's house. This house is a Muslim household. You think you can be the parents and be what they call considerate to your children by letting them practice kufr in your house. How are you going to, how are you going to meet your Lord when he commands you to save yourselves and your family from the hellfire and you let them practice kufr right in your house coming in your house the lady is coming in your house coming in your house with a baby from a castle and you happy well at least she's pregnant we'll try to get her married later or something 
this deen is Islam and the people in charge of the households have been commanded to save the family from the fire. Wallahi, even the Kafirs, they kick their children out when they go too far. We got our children practicing all kind of kufr. He's talking about he don't want to go to the masjid till he's 16 years old. He don't want to go to the masjid because ain't no children there. Where he want to meet the children? In the hellfire? We have to practice this deen of Islam and the people in charge of their houses, they have to make sure that everybody in their house is practicing this deen. And whoever don't want to practice this deen, let him go to the hellfire by himself or herself. What about if she stepped out without it, even though you told her she can't live without it? Uh, everyone asked about a hadith that we had quoted in one of our classes, where the Messenger of Allah والسلام, was telling us that there are three people who will not have their dua answered. And salah is a part of the dua. And one of them is a person who has a wife with bad character but doesn't divorce her. Your wife doesn't want to practice Islam, just divorce her. When she goes out, when she steps out without it, even though you told her, just let her keep stepping. That's all. Let her come back, find her stuff on the porch. Huh, you don't want to throw her stuff in the garbage. You don't want to wear it. Let her come back and she don't have nothing. She told me where my stuff at. I said, you ain't want to wear nothing anyway. Wallahi, nobody has to tolerate kufr. And we shouldn't think that I'm trying to be sarcastic or funny or that I'm being too harsh or whatever. This is the truth. If the people don't want to practice Islam with us, just let's let them go. Are you going to make the people believe after Allah has led them astray? Nobody can make somebody believe in Islam. You can bring that horse to Islam, but you can't make them practice it. Is there any reason for her not to cover herself because she just accepted Islam and she doesn't feel comfortable to wear it? Uh, how, how will she feel comfortable wearing a hijab of fire in the hellfire? And we know that sometimes you'll be punished according to what you do here. You're just in the hellfire with a fire jilbab on and a fire khimal on, burning in the hellfire. You think she'll feel comfortable with that? Ask her. Which one you feel more comfortable with? <laughs> this nice, beautiful silk one your husband bought you, or that one out of fire? And we know, you can't imagine it. And one of the ulama in this tafsir, he was mentioning it. And I forgot what verse that is right now. But Allah said that he's going to make clothing out of the fire. You can't even imagine right now how you're going to take fire and make clothing for the people to put it on. Because you can't weave the fire. But Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala can do whatever He wills. And He wills that He's going to weave this fire for you and have some clothing for you of fire and the hellfire. That's when she wants to wear a khima. She acts like she's going to live long enough to be comfortable with silk on. Is there a lady not comfortable with silk? If no, can you separate or divorce with her because of she doesn't want to wear her hijab? Just say she doesn't want to practice Islam. Now she doesn't want to wear her hijab. That sounds nice. And then when you make the uh, re reply to a divorce, or, uh, he didn't divorce her just because she didn't wear that. He wore something else, he got all mad. Don't say that, just say she's not practicing Islam. What the importance of wearing the hijab? Is it wajib or... Yes, it's compulsory. And that would be a talk in itself. But Alhamdulillah, Abu Bilal Mustaf al-Kennedy, rahimahullah, he uh, wrote a nice book called The Muslim Women's Dress, according to the Quran and the Sunnah, the three books, the three dollars or so. So people can buy this book and read it and know why it's compulsory for the women to dress the way they have to dress. And also we hope that it will be published soon, The Muslim Man's Dress, as there was a, a talk uh, the Muslim man dress because the Muslim men still walking around looking like Kufa and the women looking like Muslims. And this is real common as uh, a case just happened the other day, uh, brothers or some days back or whenever, the brothers rolled up on a brother. Boy, he's trying to rap to a sister. Ball head, long braid in the back, tank top, tight pants, cigarette in one hand, beer in the left hand, drinking it like the shaitan. The brothers rolled on him, 
What you doing messing with the Muslim sister? The sister said, please, he's my husband. <laughs> Wallahi, if we think this is funny, it's not funny. We still dressing like the Catholic and think that it's okay. The Muslim women, really, they're the ones that don't have no problem. We are the ones that have problems. Wallahi, you walk into a Muslim restaurant. You walk into a Muslim restaurant. You got a kufi and a thobe on. You look like a Muslim. You see everybody in there, they look like Catholics on the street. You don't say nothing. You order your sandwich and your stuff. Then a brother comes after you and says, Salaamu Alaikum. He's talking to the other brothers. He's saying, Astaghfirullah. I ain't give nobody the salam. I walked in. You feeling like a criminal, but how you even gonna know they Muslim? They see you walking and you look like a Muslim. Why they don't? Why they don't give you the greeting? Because they are ashamed of Islam and they proud of kufr, and that's why they walk around representing kufr and don't represent Islam. If a community has an imam and a board of trustees, and a sister was nominated to go to the board, does she need the permission of the imam to accept? Is it permissible according to Islam for her to serve on such a board? Allah knows best.